Amen. So here we are in Acts chapter 3. So we got through uh, the story in Acts chapter 2 um, over the last couple of weeks. We took a couple of weeks to get through Acts chapter 2. So we saw um, in Acts chapter 2 with this great miracle, uh, the day of Pentecost, where they spoke in different languages so they could preach the gospel to people from all over um, the world from different nations, and we saw that that miracle had a great purpose of getting um, the gospel out to all, all different types of people from different nationalities that were going to go back to um, their homes. So we saw that that was just a great miracle and a great purpose to that miracle. Now let's look at Acts chapter 3. We see a story in Acts chapter 3 of Peter and John. So Peter and John go into, they're in Jerusalem, they're going to go into the temple, and it's at the ninth hour, six o'clock. Um, in the afternoon. They begin at the ninth hour, and in num verse number two it says, A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask him alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, the, the gate Beautiful is just, is just what it says. It was just the name of the gate. It was a gate to um, a public place in the temple. There was a lot of people there, and there was a man there that would ask for um, donations, alms. He was he was lame, though. He was, he was uh, uh, what's the, the politically correct term that you would say today? I don't even think you can say handicapped anymore, but he, he was disabled of some kind um, on, in his legs. So here we see um, Peter and John, they see this man, and Peter, in verse number four, fastened his eyes upon him and John, with John and said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He thought that they were going to give him um, alms or money. And then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give, give, I have, I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaped up and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So that's a great story there of this miracle um, that uh, Peter and John um, just did to this man. Now, this is actually a pretty decent um, picture of salvation right here, this, this miracle um, by itself. Here, this man, you know, he couldn't walk. He was, he was lame. And, of course, what does Peter say? He says, in the name of Jesus Christ. Of course, how are we saved? We're saved in the name of Jesus Christ. He took him by the right hand. He lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So how are we saved? You know, are we saved over this process of time? Are we healed um, through time for our salvation? No, we hath everlasting life as soon as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a nice picture of salvation. Then verse number 8, And he leaping up stood, and he walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. This kind of could picture our life after salvation. After we're healed, immediately we get up and we start walking um, towards God, to start walking the way God um, wants us to walk. But look at, um, go turn to Luke chapter 9. The main thing that happens here, though, is back to Acts chapter 3, go to Luke chapter 9, is here you see Peter and John, they do a miracle. You know, they do a miracle just like Jesus did miracles. So you're like, what in the world? These guys just healed this man, and they can heal um, people, but actually they've been doing this for some time. If you remember um, the Gospels, they've been healing people for some time. Jesus himself gave the apostles this power, or the 12 disciples, this specific gift. Turn to Luke chapter 9 and look down at verse number 1 of Luke chapter 9. Then he called, this is Jesus, he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. So that means they, were, they had... They had the power to cast out demons, and they had the power to actually heal people. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God, and again, to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. So we see in, even in Luke chapter 9, back, you know, at the beginning um, when the, the apostles were starting, or the disciples were starting to preach um, Jesus Christ, or Jesus was sending them out, he gave them this power to heal. He gave the specific power of healing to the 12 disciples. Go back to Acts chapter 3. So we're going to get into why he gave that to them, and do we have that same power today? We'll talk about that towards the end of the sermon, but let's continue in Acts chapter 3 and just cover a few more things, and then we'll come back to this main question tonight about, 
you know, the healing power of the disciples, and is that, um, is that power on us today? Look at Acts chapter 3 and verse number 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. So first of all, we see here again, just like in Acts chapter 2, we see in Acts chapter 3 that this miracle, and I'm kind of answering the question to the end, I'm starting to answer it already, but it had a specific purpose. It wasn't, it wasn't just to do miracles for the sake of doing miracles. You know, it wasn't just to go and blabber a bunch of things to, you know, that meant nothing, be, to just, you know, be weird. It, it was to preach the gospel in Acts chapter 2. They were preaching the gospel in other languages, just like in Acts chapter 3. Look at the next few verses. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. This man was a testimony of what just happened to him. He was healed, but he wasn't one of these that were healed and just went away. This guy got healed, and he jumped up, and he was praising God. And they that knew it, they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder. Look, they knew who this guy was. They knew this was, the, it was a proof of God's power is what this was, at which, and which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them. Unto who? Unto them, unto Peter and John, in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. So they did this great miracle just to be awesome? No, they did this great miracle, and what happened? What happened? They did this miracle, and all of a sudden, all the people run to Peter and John. Wouldn't you like to be out soul winning and just be walking down, like walking by a park? I mean, you're going you're gonna to chuckle when I say this, but how would you like to just walk by a park and just have all the people just run to you? Just sprint towards you and just gather around you. This is what's happening here. They did this great miracle, and all the people just immediately just are drawn to them. Look at verse number 12. Again, these miracles had a purpose, and the purpose was to f further the gospel itself. Look at Acts chapter 3 and verse number 12. And Peter saw it, and he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? So, first of all, all the people run to them. They did this great miracle. All the people run to them. There's a reason God gave them this power. It's to further the gospel itself. But notice the very first thing that Peter does. This is a side note. Notice the very first thing Peter does. What is the first thing? Peter just did a great thing. He just healed this man. He just did something that none of the physicians of that time could do. Nobody could have done what he did. It was an absolute miracle right in front of people. What is the first thing that he does? He, he, before he starts preaching the gospel, before he starts doing anything, he gives credit to the Lord right away. Right away in our lives, no matter what happens to us, anything good that happens to us, anything that we come up with that's great, anything that an answered prayer that we have, you need to be checking all the answered prayers. We, all, we throw a lot of prayers up, and I, I think we, th we forget sometimes to remember that the, you know, a lot of our problems just go away. A lot of our prayers are answered. So make sure in your life, when anything good happens, when anything's going on with you, that you give praise to God, you give credit to the Lord right away. You have some huge success at work, you give credit to the Lord right away. Amen. You just give credit to the Lord. Peter gives credit right away. Before he gets to the business that he's about to, that he's there for, he gives credit to God. In verse 13, it says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up. He just gets right into it. <laughs> he said, whom, he's, he's glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One. Here he, I mean, he just points out right away, just right away at the beginning. He's like, you killed God. He says the Holy One. He's speaking to the Jews here in their language. So many times, maybe dozens of times in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, Psalms especially, that the words, the Holy One of Israel, are used. He's using language that is specific to, you know, prick the hearts of the Jews in this temple. And he says, you denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. He's directly referencing Jesus being God, saying, you killed your Messiah. Look at verse 15. And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. 
And his name through faith in his and and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong. He's he's saying this is who this is the name through whom this man was healed, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him his perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that through the ignorance he did it, also did also your rulers. He's, he's like, you know, hopefully he did it through ignorance. He's talking to this crowd and he's like, you know, you, know, you, you must not have known that he was the Messiah. So he's going to preach it to them and try to get them to change their minds about this, but those things which God before has showed by the mouth of the prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. He's like, he fulfilled all of the prophecies of the prophets. And then he says in verse 19, he says, repent therefore, repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing, refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So he preaches Jesus to them. He preaches Jesus to them and he says, he was the Messiah, he was God, you, you must, hopefully there's people here that were ignorant of this, and now I'm telling you the truth, even though the prophets talked about it, even though every prophecy was fulfilled by this man, he's telling them what they've done. You murdered him, you killed him. He's like, you know, he's saying, now repent. He says, repent. And what does he mean by that? He says, repent. And then it says, be converted. He's saying, change your mind. Change from being ignorant, as he said a couple verses earlier, to now knowing what you've done. Change your mind. He doesn't say, repent of your sins. He doesn't say, turn from your sins. He doesn't say, he doesn't say change your lives. Stop drinking. Stop being hypocrites. No, he's saying, he's saying, look up at verse number 17. He says, through ignorance, ye did it. He's saying, stop being dumb Realize what you've done and convert, he says in verse number 19. That is what repent means. Look, this idea of repent of your sins, you know the dictionary, you know the dictionary definition of repent has actually even been changed? Even if you look up defini the definition of repent in the dictionary, it says, it says um, you know, turn from sin. That's not what Peter is talking about. Peter is not talking about turning from any sin. He is talking about, he is trying to convince them that they killed the Messiah. That is simply what he's trying to say. He's saying, repent, believe me, change your mind, be converted. And then your sins will be blotted out. After you've what? Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, repent of your sins is not in the Bible. That phrase is not in the Bible. The closest you can find to repent of your sins is 1 John 1, 9. And it doesn't say repent of your sins. Turn to, turn to 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've, I've said that verse 80,000 times in my life because it's one of the things that you chant every morning in a Lutheran church service to keep yourself from going to hell. But the Bible here is saying, confess your sins. Even the idea of repenting from your sins, meaning turning from your sins, look, that's a good thing to do. Do it. That's a good thing to do. Turn from your sins. You know, confess your sins to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sins to the Lord and he'll forgive you. We're talking about having a relationship with God. We're talking about keeping up your relationship with your heavenly father. Just like you would keep up a relationship with your parents, kids, or your, your children, Parents, I mean, I want my kids, if they do something wrong, I want them to confess it. I want them to tell me, Dad, I did this. This was my fault. Look, nothing infuriates me more as a parent than when your kid does something and he won't own up to it. I mean, not, I mean that, that just makes me like, I mean, that, that's what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about. It's talking about having an honest relationship with our Heavenly Father. Okay, this idea of repenting of your sins, it, it's, it's made up. It's not in the Bible. Peter here is talking about repenting and being converted. He's talking about changing your mind from your ignorance to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, believing on his name and being converted. And guess what? Your sins will be blotted out if you do that. You know, I mean, people today, the funny thing is you go out soul winning today and people today, they don't even, they don't even have the same, they don't even have the same definition in their own mind of what repent means. 
They think they have to repent of their sins to be saved, but they don't even know what that means. Some people think you have to stop sinning. So, I mean, those are the, you know, those are the real serious ones. You know, you have to stop sinning. To what degree, they have no idea. Because most people, you will find people that think that they can become perfect. You, you would go soul winning long enough and you will find those people. That's, that's a fun door to be at. But the point is, is that some people think that repenting means you have to just stop sinning or turn from your sins, whatever that even means. Because how, my, how many of my sins do I need to turn from? Most people would agree you can't turn from all of them. So where's the list? Where's the list of how many sins and which sins I have to turn from and how many times I can do each sin and how many times I have to ask for forgiveness? It's a really complicated um, equation when you think about it. But a lot of people think you have to turn from your sins. That's what repent of your sins means. Other people think that repent of your sins means, oh, you just have to be sorry for your sins. You just have to, like, feel sorry. And that means you've repented of your sins. They're kind of using confess and repent as synonymous words there. But the point is, not only does the Bible say nothing about repenting of your sins for salvation, it doesn't say repent of your sins at all, but people don't even know what that means. People are taught that today, and they don't even know what it means. Look, if people would just follow the logical conclusions of their beliefs to, to just fill in the gaps, they would end up at the gospel, because it's the only thing that makes any sense. If the Bible says you can know you're saved, and, you know, turning from my sins, I know I can't turn from all of them, but there's no list of which ones I have to turn from. How could I ever know I'm saved? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. But anyway, go back to Acts chapter 3. He's talking about be converted. He says, repent, change your mind. I'm talking to you about Jesus, the Messiah, God, the Holy One. Change your mind and you'll have your sins blotted out. What he's talking about is, go to Romans chapter 3. He's talking about after conversion. He's not talking about confessing your sins every day. That wouldn't make any sense. He's talking about after conversions, after conversion, your sins are blotted out. Your sins are blotted out as far as your salvation goes. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse number 22. We talk about Romans chapter 3 and verse number 22 or verse number 23 all the time. I always like to, every now and then, you go out and you repeat the same verses out soul winning. I always like to go back and read the chapters every now and then. Go back and read the chapters. Read five verses before, five verses after. You know, it gives you some good context on these verses that, that sometimes we say them so many times. You know, it's nice to get the whole context of, you know, these passages. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. It says, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all upon them that believe, for there is no difference. He's talking about, he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse number 22 is a very interesting verse. He's saying even that, first of all, how are your sins blotted out? Your sins are blotted out because when God looks at you, he sees, he doesn't see your righteousness because you have none. He doesn't see your righteousness. He sees what? He sees the righteousness of God. Guess what? The Holy One. That's the righteousness that he sees, which is by what? By working, by repenting of your sins, by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. You know what that means? You know what that means? It means no matter what. It's like, it doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. You all need the righteousness of God. Everyone needs the righteousness of God because even the best person on the planet needs the righteousness of God or they're going to go to hell. He's like, there's no difference. There's no difference. Why? For all have sinned. See, that's a great verse to just refresh yourself on. Before, you know, every now and then. Yes, we, we read, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no difference. That's the sense, look, that's the sense in which, look, all sin is not equal. And, you know, this idea that all sin is equal, that, that's false. All sin is not equal. But it is true that one sin is enough to get you to hell. That's what he's talking about. If there's no difference between man in the sense that every man needs the righteousness of God. Right there. Look, that is the mechanics of salvation. Right there. You look at, you know, you think, okay, salvation, the gospel, it's simple. But I'm always kind of, I'm kind of like this, right? Well, how does it work? Well, how does that thing work? You know, a couple of the uh, guys in the church are like that too. Yeah, but how does it work? It works because God looks at us. He looks at me. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand in front of Jesus one day, and, and God's going to look at me, and ugh. But thank God he's going to see the righteousness of Jesus, not me. You know, we're covered in the blood. 
He's going to see the blood on the doorposts, is what he's going to see. Because we put on, the Bible says, we put on, you know, it says, put ye on. Romans 13, it says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to have Jesus on me. He's covering me. He's blotting out. So God doesn't see what, what was really done in this body. That's the mechanics of salvation, folks. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. I love how it works. And I love how God designed it, and I love how it works. Look at Acts chapter 3 and verse number 20. Acts chapter 3 and verse number 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Look, until the end times, until he comes back again, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He's talking about, you know, here's the end times prophecy. But guess what? Well, one thing that's nice to look at there is look at verse number 21. He says, he must, until the times of what? He doesn't say until the end times. He says the time of, but what's going to happen in the end times? This is a kind of a nice little um, synonym of the end times right here. He's going to say, he's saying, you know what the end times will be? The end times will be the restitution of all things. Remember the sermon series, the two-part series, why good things happen to bad people? And then the, the sermon after that was why, you know, bad things happen to good people? Or maybe it was the other way around. I can't remember which one I preached first. But the point is, you know, we don't have to worry about why good things happen to bad people. That's a real question for a lot of people out there. We got it today. Somebody at the door said, you know, some, somebody at the door said, you could tell, you know, I don't think it, it's that he was irritated with Garrett. I think he was irritated with this idea of Christianity. He's like, you know, that, oh, somebody thinks this guy said he was a Buddhist. And he said, you know, but, you know, I, 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 I'm going to live the best life and all this. And I'm sure he was a very nice man. But then he says, he's like, you could tell he had, he had kind of a, he had kind of a burn in his saddle over Christianity. He's like, because this isn't fair. This is what he said. And I'll get into fair here in a few minutes. But, he, but he's saying to Garrett, he's like, you know, you think you could take a murderer? And then, oh, say a prayer. Ooh, 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 ooh. He's all doing this. And he's all putting on a show. And he's like, and then he gets to go to heaven? He's like, I don't think so. But, you know, I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that. And I wish, you know, if the guy wasn't so excited, I wish we could have talked to him for a few minutes. But, you know, it didn't really work out that way. But the point is, you know, why good things happen to bad people? Look, it's all going to be made right. It's all going to be fair. And that's what Peter is saying in verse number 21. He says, because guess what? When Jesus comes back in those end times, yeah, there's going to be some rough times leading up to that. And even the saints themselves are going to be saying, how long, O Lord? People are going to be begging God in heaven, saying, how long until you make it all right? But guess what? He's going to make it all right. He's going to, and there will be the restitution of all things. All things will be made right. All things will be made right, both good and bad. It will be fair. It will be fair. So that's something just to think about when you read um, verses like that. The end times, yeah, there's going to be some rough times coming through the end times, and we're going to go through those end times. You know, maybe not us or whatever, but the point is everything will be made right in the end. And that's what we can always have peace in. Look at verse number 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up among your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among his people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many have spoken, have likewise foretold these days. It's like, you guys, like, God, God has been sending prophet after prophet after prophet to you. I mean, think, he's talking to the Jews here. Think of his crowd. Okay, look, he's, he's talking to us and everybody, but he's speaking to the Jews in the temple. He's saying, look, you've had prophet after prophet after prophet, and this man, Jesus Christ, was the Holy One that fulfilled everything that every single one of them said. Look at verse 25. You're the children of the prophets. Turn to Galatians 3.16. You're the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Saying, oh man, that's talking about like how the Jews are going to bless every nation and, and it's like they're just going to be a huge blessing to everyone. No, that's not what he's talking about. 
Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 16. He's saying unto Abraham, And thy seed, thy seed shall all the nations, all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 16. He's referring to the same thing that Paul is referring to here in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 16. He says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. That seed of Abraham that will be a blessing to all nations and all kindreds is Jesus Christ. That is what he is talking about. He is talking about, I mean, every single, I mean, if you have any doubts about that, what is Peter preaching in Acts chapter 3? He is preaching Jesus Christ. He is healing by Jesus Christ. The whole point of everything that he is saying is Jesus Christ. He is talking about the seed of Jesus Christ will be a blessing to all nations. That is how, look, that is the seed. That seed is how Dave, the Davidic you know, promise is fulfilled, is through Jesus Christ. What other king could take David's reign into eternity other than Jesus Christ? other than God himself. Look at verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So now I want to talk about this idea, this idea of the healing powers that Peter and John had. You know, turn back to Acts chapter 2, if you would, for just a few minutes. Just turn back to Acts chapter 2. and Let's, let's explore this idea of these healing powers. Because you hear a lot of people today talk about, you know, that they have these same powers that the apostles have. Look at Acts chapter 2 and look at verse number 22. Look at verse number 22 of Acts chapter 2. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. Okay, so he was saying that this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, he was approved among you, among you by miracles and wonders and signs. Okay, so he was a man approved of God, but he's not saying he was approved of God. He's saying he was approved of God among you. So what Peter is saying here in Acts chapter 2 is he's saying that Jesus showed himself. He showed himself amongst you that he was approved of God. How? By doing miracles and signs and wonders. They, they had a purpose. I mean, they're not just out there just doing magic tricks to, you know, to glorify themselves. It was to show people that Jesus Christ was approved of God. It was to be a proof. I mean, that's, I, I like that word. It was to be a proof, a testimony, a witness. The, the miracles were a sign of his approval from God, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves know. The miracles that Jesus did were to validate himself amongst the people. And the miracles that the apostles did were for the same reason, to validate the truth of what they were saying. And look at the example in Acts chapter 3 and the results that that produced. He showed, Peter showed that he was approved of God. He showed by that miracle that it gave him credibility to bring those people to him and to preach the name of of Jesus Christ. These miracles had a purpose. They had a purpose, and it was to build the church right after Jesus was gone. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, look at verse uh, number 12 of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse number 12. And the hands of the apostles, and by the hands of the apostles, sorry, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with, here it is again, one accord in Solomon's porch. And the resters, no man joined himself to them, then no one dared, but the people magnified them. And believers were more added to the Lord. You see that? Multitudes of both men and women, insomuch that they brought the forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Look, they, they were making quite a stir here. The purpose was to add to disciples. The purpose was to add to the church. So, can, I mean, many people take advantage of this today. Can we heal today? Can I walk by and have my shadow heal somebody today? You know, many people claim this today. Yeah, I mean, look, is God less great today? Is God less powerful today? This is what the Pentecostals, 
will say today. Well, is God less powerful than he was back then? Turn to Mark chapter 16. Unfortunately, these stories from Acts and these powers given to the 12, 12 apostles specifically, especially, has been taken advantage of by many charlatans today. Many people that don't even have the right gospel today. So you can't, like, if somebody has the right, right gospel or doesn't have the right gospel, you can't listen to anything that they say. Okay? I mean, I'm talking about people like Benny Hinn, you know, who's still around, by the way. I mean, this guy's been going for years and years and years. He's been proven a fraud by all, like, I can't, I can't tell you how many times he's been proven. A, you know, he's the guy that people come up and, and you know, they, they're, they're in a wheelchair and he puts their hand on their, their forehead and they, they explode and fly backwards. And, you know, and they, they're slayed in the spirit and all this stuff. It, it's a huge fraud. Like, Dateline and, and, and things like this have done reports on this guy and just exposed him as a fraud. They've exposed him, you know, in his financial dealings. He's just, I mean, it's just complete, I mean, they literally like, and it's sad because he's taking advantage of weak and sick people. But what will happen is weak and sick people will go to his big convention and then they will go to the convention and like they will be kept away from, you know, ever reaching the stage. I mean, this has been proven. They've been undercover investigations. They, they kept him away and, and they only let the people up there that are kind of, they're in on it. Right? They're in on it, and they're, they're, they know what to do, and, and, and the whole thing. It's pretty crazy if you've ever seen it. Here's another one, though. Look at Mark chapter 16, and verse number 14. Afterward, so the question is, can we do miracles today? Can I just go to, you know, the children's hospital, and just, you know, I'm a man of God, and just heal everyone there? You know, can I do that? You know, if I can, why, why would I even be here? Okay, I'd just be going all over the country just healing every kid in America is what I would be doing. But I don't want to give away the answer. Look at Mark chapter 16 and verse number 14. The point is, people take advantage of this today. They, they're, they're taking advantage. You know, Benny Hinn will say, send me $1,000 and you will be rich. And then people just send him all this money. Look, it's good for business. It's good for, you know, growing big auditoriums of, of people, but it's not the truth. Look at Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto them, to the eleven, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, this is the great commission right here. He says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Look, he's saying, like, he's, he's, he's prophesying, like, the, the day of Pentecost right here. In, in verse number 17, he's saying they should speak with new tongues. And many other places in the book of Acts, where they just spoke with different languages. They'll lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. He even talks about serpents, which, by the way, happened to Paul. He's talking about getting bit by serpents. You'll have Pentecostal pastors today that bring snakes to church. As a matter of fact, just a couple of years ago, one died. He brought a rattlesnake to church. And he's like, look, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm taking up serpents. And he's like, and he died. Because they're claiming, and they're like, oh, you know, God's just as powerful today. Look, it's all scams and it's all frauds. And, I mean, the man died of a snake bite. But here's, here is the thing, though. God can still do whatever he wants. Even though, you know, he still does and can and will perform miracles today. God will do that. But why not the same powers? Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me explain that to you. Why don't we and the men of this church and the, and the ladies of this church, why don't we have these same, you know, everybody... You know, we're way over the top with superheroes, by the way, in this country. It, it's way out of control. I mean, the, I don't know what the obsession is with superheroes and superheroes in the media. It's everywhere. But the point is, is everybody wants powers today. Everybody wants, you know, powers. And they read this, and, you know, it's, it's, there's scams, there's frauds that take advantage of this. But we do not have the same, you know, the same gifts granted to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible talks about, you know, we all have different gifts, okay? And we all don't have the same gifts granted to us. But look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, and look at verse 19. It says, Now there, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints 
and the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. See, what was happening in the book of Acts with what we're studying now is God was building the foundation of his church. God was laying the foundation with the apostles and the prophets. He was laying the foundation of, you know, building the early church. And the real answer, so look, we are standing on that foundation. We are built upon that foundation. It says we're built upon the foundation of the apostles. So they're the foundation. And this is how God chose to build that foundation. But really the answer lies to this in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, turn that. So we know that we're built upon the foundation of what... So what, we are, what are we reading about in Acts? What are we studying about in Acts? We're studying about the foundation that we stand upon today. We're, we're, you know, when Peter's up here and he's preaching the gospel to the Jews in the temple and you know, thousands of people are getting saved and thousands of people are being added to the church, this is the foundation that we stand on today. Now look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, the context here is it's a story about a man that went to heaven, excuse me, and about a man that went to hell. And the man in hell is begging to get out. He wants out. I mean, who wouldn't? Every, look, I can tell you one thing. Everybody that's in hell right now, they want out. And this is an example. It's a picture. It's a slice. It's a snapshot of what hell is like. So God gives us this story in Luke chapter 16. He gives us the story so we can see what it's like. So we can see how the hardest heart is going to be when he's in hell or when she's in hell. Now look at verse 26. It says, now Abraham is telling him, like, we, you can't come out. It says, beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fix. He's like, there, there's, that they that would pass from hence to you cannot. We can't go to you. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So he said, you can't get out. It's like, we can't come help you. We can't give you any water. You can't come here. And then he says this. He's like, okay, plan B. He's like, plan B. He says, I pray you therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. He's talking about Lazarus. He's like, I have five brethren. He's like, I got five brothers. I mean, the guy's got, you know, he's in hell. He's got some character. You know, this kind of shows you right here that, you know, the people in hell, they're not just going to be, there's going to be a lot of nice guys in hell. I don't know what to tell you. There's going to be a lot of nice people in hell. This guy, this guy, he's not just thinking about himself. After he realizes he's doomed, he says, go to my brothers. Go to my family. That he may testify unto them unless all, they also come into this place of torment. He's like, they're going to come here too because they don't believe. They, they didn't believe. They believe like me. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no. He's like, no. It's not going to work. He's like, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. You know what he's saying? He's saying, he's saying, they have the Bible. He said they have Moses and the prophet. They have the law. I mean, what advantage have the Jew? They had the oracles of God. It's like they had it. They had it already. And guess what? Here's why, here's our miracle. Here's our miracle. We have the whole thing. Amen. We have the, look, Peter didn't have this. Peter didn't have this. John didn't have this. Especially at the time that they were doing this miracle in Acts chapter 3. They didn't have what we have. This is our miracle. This is our power. Right here. You're like, why don't we have power? Whoa! This is our power. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Look, this is our power. This is why when we go out soul winning, we just don't explain things. This is why when you go out and somebody says, I want to hear the gospel. I want to know. I'm like, well, it's kind of like this. No, that's not what I say. I say, I'll show you everything from the Bible. And look, I don't just quote them the Bible. I show them the Bible. I mean, I don't just quote them. You know, Romans 3.23 says this. You know, Romans 3.10 says this. Romans 6.23 says this. I don't just quote them the Bible. I, like, I show them the words. You say, why? I mean, they, as long as they hear it. But look, the thing, the fact that it is God's word. And by the way, nobody could get saved if they didn't believe that the words that they were reading were God's word. Right. If they believe that some man in the Middle East wrote this book and they're reading these words, there's no way they could get saved. 
They have to believe. But guess what? That's not, it's in Fresno, that's not really that big of an issue. I actually, I don't know that I could think of too many times where I've been reading the gospel to somebody that wanted to hear the gospel and they told me and we had to stop because they said, yeah, but I don't believe that that's God's word. A lot of people today, especially in this area, believe that the Bible is God's words. They just don't know what it says. They just don't know what, what the gospel is. They've been told so many false things that they just don't know. But back to the point. That's why we show the Bible out soul winning. Because it's God's authority, not ours, that gives it power. And this is our power. This is our miracle today. This is our miracle worker right here. The Bible. Now look, this is also why, by the way, this is also why you could never have a successful atheist society. Ever. Say, you say, why? This is what people like Richard Dawkins and, you know, Sam Harris and all these other, you know, godless idiots, they'll, they'll say, oh, you don't need the Bible for morality. But here's the thing. You, have, you can have the best ideas. You can have the best ideas. And, and guess what? People do come up with some pretty good ideas as far as governing and things like that. But any idea that's truly good was hijacked from the Bible, first of all. Any good moral law is in the Bible. So they're just hijacking you. But even the point is, even if you had the best idea, let's say I have the best laws. I wrote a set of laws, and if you run a country by this laws, even if you had the best ideas, it would never work. Because under whose authority? Mine? Under my, I mean, it's, it, you know what it is? It would, be, it would be you think versus what I think. That's what it would be. It would never, ever work. I mean, just some examples. I mean, whose land is it? I mean, just that one question right there. Nobody would ever agree. What, here's, here's one for you. Here's one for you. What is fair? No one would ever agree. What is fair? This is why, I mean, you, fair in what? Fair in everything. No one would ever agree. What is fair? Just think about this, this silly example. This is why I always say at work, you should, never, you should never ask what anyone that you work with makes. You should never ask somebody's salary at work or their wage or whatever. You should never ask your boss. You should never ask your coworker. You should never ask somebody that works for you. Why? Because it'll never end well. Because let's say you two are the best friends and you work together. And you work together and you just like one day you just tell each other how much you make. Then you know then it's like, oh, he, he makes more than me? <sighs> Guy's a loser. I'm way better at my job than him. Or maybe you're just like, I work like way harder than him. That's not what? That's not fair. Or that guy's like, he finds out that you make uh, more than him, and he's just like, uh, you know, well, you know, it's like, you know, it, it, nobody would ever think it's fair, is the point. Because there's no, I mean, they would just think they deserve more. Or that you're getting, I mean, they would think that you're getting too much, or that they deserve more. It, one of those two things. See, rules, laws, morals, they must have authority behind them. An atheist society could never work. Or guess what? They're just another idea. They're just another idea. But, you know, some ideas work better, is what Sam Harris will tell you, or what Richard Dawkins will tell you. But here's the thing. Here's actually the reality of it. We're not even good at good ideas as, as people. You know, communism killed... You know, less than 75 years ago, communism killed over 100 million people. And we're wanting to go back to that. Like, we're, we're, we're not smart. We don't have any good ideas. In this country, we're just talking about today, in this country, we can't even get murder right. right. We can't even decide, as a country, if murder is wrong. Are you joking? Somebody showed me a video today of a congressman asking this lady. He's like, well, can you murder a 10-year-old child? And she's like, well... I mean, it took her a couple seconds. She's like, no. How about a two-year-old child? No. She's like, one week old. No. How about a day old? No. And then and she's like, he's like, well, how about, how about like, you know, five minutes before they were born? Eight inches away. As if some miracle of life happens when a child is like born in that few seconds. 
It's ridiculous. These murdering, godless, evil people don't believe in miracles anyway. But the point is, we can't even get murder right. We don't have any good ideas. It would never work without God's authority. We think we can work it with our own authority. We can't even get murder right. We can't even get, we can't even get like the natural attraction between a man and a woman right. I mean, are you joking? Probably the most natural physical attraction that a woman goes with a man. We can't even get that right. And people that don't even have that unnatural problem, they're like, oh yeah, oh, that, that looks, that's okay. There could never be a society without God. Give me a break. It would destroy itself in the first year. It would be ridiculous. The only thing keeping us together in this country is the, the threads that people still hang on to from the Bible. That's it. But it's because God's word has power. That's why. Back to the point. It's because God's word has... Now, I'm not talking about like, you know, just some like made up theoretical... I'm, I'm talking about actual power. Spiritual power. You know, physical power. The power to change minds. The power to change hearts the power to change actual lives i mean that's the bible has real the bible is a miracle that has power that we hold today that is our power today so yeah does does god i mean jesus was laying a foundation in acts chapter 2 acts chapter 3 he's laying the foundation that we're standing on as we hold the whole counsel of god it's not that he just didn't give us power he gave us a different power a, a greater power I would say, the greatest power. So, does God still do miracles? How about that question? Does God still do miracles? I have the power of the Bible. Every single time I go out and preach the gospel and they accept it and they get saved, that's a miracle. Do you know that? Every single time you preach the gospel to somebody and they pass from death to life in front of your face, that is a miracle. Don't dismiss the miracles in your life. You want to see more miracles? Come out with us more. You see miracles every week here. How about like just like miracles of like just just fixing us? Like, oh man, somebody's unhealthy or somebody all the time. How? Through prayer. That's how. Turn to James chapter 4. Through prayer. And, and look, I totally understand why God, and I'm going to explain to you, like this is, this is my opinion, but I think I know why God did it this way. Because of what he says to us and how we act, I can kind of just, I can kind of assume why God did it this way. Look at James chapter 4 and verse number 2. James chapter 4, actually you turn to Luke chapter 11. Sorry, I led you astray. Turn to Luke chapter 11 and verse number 9. I'm going to read James 4 verse number 2 to you. You go to Luke 11. The Bible says in James 4, it says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, he says, yet ye have not because ye ask not. He's saying, he's saying you're trying to get these things through the wrong ways. You know, we know they're the wrong things. We've studied that verse before. But he's basically saying, he's like, I, I don't know how many times Jesus has to say in the Bible. He's like, you know, you don't ask. You don't ask. You don't ask. Look at Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 11, verse number 9. He says, and I say unto you, what? Ask. And it shall be given unto you. Look what he says here. Seek. And you shall find. What should you seek? I don't know. How about this? How about this? If you seek this, you know what you know? You'll know what to do? You'll know what to ask for. So in James chapter 4, as James chapter 4 talks about, he's saying you have not because you ask not. He's like, the things that you ask for, he's like, you ask amiss. He's like, you're asking for all these dumb things. He's like, you're asking for all these things that are going to hurt you. And then he says, ask, but he says, seek. Seek knowledge and seek wisdom. I guarantee those are prayers that if you mean them, God will answer those prayers. And ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And everyone that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. He's like, hey, ask. Why don't you ask? It'll be given to you. And then he gives an example of a son and a father. He says, a son asks bread of you that is a father. We give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, we give him a, fi a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he ask for an egg, we give him a scorpion? If he then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more should the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So there's a good thing to ask for too, to be filled with the Spirit. Get yourself out of the flesh 
and pray to be filled with the Spirit. I mean, Jesus just told you right here, he'll give it to you. And he says here, he says, like, he's like, would you give, would any parent give their child like a, a serpent if they ask for an egg or, you know, a rock if they ask for a piece of bread? You're like, no, never. Like, especially today. People just want to give their kids everything today. I'm not going to give my kid a rock. He says, but you're evil. I'm good. He's like, you're evil and you still would give your kids what they wanted. He's like, just ask me and I will give it to you. Here's the, our real problem is that we just don't ask. We just don't ask. We don't seek and we don't knock. Imagine, here's the thing. Here's why I think that God did it this way. This is just, you know, the pastor's opinion. I think that, that he didn't just give us these powers where we just can walk by and our shadows can just heal people. You know, that's good. Do you think we'd ever talk to God? <laughs> we don't pray the way it is. We don't pray the way it is. And God's going to give us all these powers and we're going to run around. He's like, he's like, you'll never pray. Instead, he says, you know what? I'm going to give you the Bible. I will give you the full revelation of what I want for you to do in this life. He's like, and then you need something from me, just ask me. Seek it from my word. Knock and I'll give it to you. Knock and I'll open the door. Ask me. And I'm telling you, if you keep track of the prayer list and the things that we pray for, man, these prayers are being answered. Prayers are being answered all the time. But we forget we forget that prayers are being answered. You know, we forget that God is taking care of us. But here's the thing. God, I mean, so why do it this way? Here's why. Because God wants to talk to you. Because God, God wants a relationship with you. God wants a relationship with his adopted children. I mean, shocking. Right? I mean, how many unsaved people out there are like, oh, you just got to have a relationship with God. They have no idea who God is. He has no idea who they are. Right. But God knows you. He knows you, and he'll never forget you. He wants a relationship with you. That's it. How, what kind of relationship is it? You ever had a friend like this? What kind of relationship? I had a friend like this in high school. It was the most irritating thing in the world. Yet, like, they never call you. It's like you're constantly calling them. So you're constantly calling them all the time. You know, they just like, I mean, they see, you know, it just look, you do all the talking, you do all the calling, you do all the giving. This guy was the cheapest guy I've ever met in my life. My wife still remembers this guy. He was so cheap. It was ridiculous. But the point is, it's just, it's just a one-way relationship. Look, you know what? You know what? Those relationships wane. Those relationships fade. Because guess what? Nobody wants a one-sided relationship. Neither does God. So yes, we have power today. We have power, just like the disciples. But we have power. We have the sword of God's word is our power. And for other things, God will do miracles for you. Ask him.